Listen, we gotta talk about something, something serious. I don't know. Sorry. What are you drunk? Oh, I haven't had a drop. Well, Listen. what's the matter with you? I walked by the Union Square bar. I was gonna go in, and I saw myself, my reflection in the window. And I thought, I wonder who that bum is. And then I saw it was me. Now, look at me. I'm a bum. Now, look at me. Look at you. You're a bum. Look at you. And look at us. Look at us. Come on. Look at us. See? A couple of bums. Hurts. Now, look. Listen to me. You've got to listen to me. It came to me. All of a sudden, I saw the whole thing. You know why I've been fired from five jobs in four years? And it's not politics. Like we always say, it's not office politics or jealousy or any of that stuff. It's booze. It's booze. A couple of drinks. We have more than a couple of drinks. We get drunk. We stay drunk most of the time. Look at that dump that we live in and the clothes that we wear. We send that child off to school like she's looking. I, I'm a drunk and I don't do my job and that's it. I'm a drunk and I don't do my job and I get fired and I can't get a job now and I... We should have done this a long time ago, taking a look at ourselves and realized we just turned into a couple of bums. Honey, what? Honey, I love you. I love you too, and I don't mean that I didn't, but we gotta face this, huh? Please. All right, we, we just won't drink so much. No, not so Look, I got a plan, and we got to do it, honey. We gotta make it work. We're gonna get sober, but we're gonna stay sober. We don't take a drop. Nothing. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan. And I'm Mike. So welcome to 15 Minute Film Fanatics. This is the podcast, as you know, where Mike and I watch movies separately, talk about them on the show for the first time. This week, we're going to talk about Days of Wine and Roses, the 1962 film by Blake Edwards, written by J.P. Miller, who actually based this upon a teleplay he wrote in 1958, which starred Cliff Robertson and Piper Laurie as the two leads. And Charles Bickford also played Kirstie's dad, as he does in this film as well. So in the first segment, we like to talk about our overall impressions of the film. We each watched it within the last week, so it's fresh in our minds. Mike, go. This movie is an emotional wrecking ball. I think that the saddest movie we've watched hitherto for the podcast has been Make Way for Tomorrow. And this makes Make Way for Tomorrow look like an episode of all in the family this it's just absolutely emotionally devastating now that you say that it's a teleplay what i've come to understand is that there's there's four or five beats in the movie where you're just utterly destroyed and i have to assume that that's where the teleplay cut off for the next episode but when you string them all together it's a very harrowing experience but it's one that leads you to hold on. I, I think that the movie does a really interesting job of interjecting weird strains of hope, right? That like when Jack, when, when Jack Lemon comes, we're home bums, first, we're bums and we're going to get better. Yeah. And, and you go, okay, well I, right. Because as a viewer, I, I Good, totally yay. buckle in for that movie. It's been so painful to watch him, you know, yell at his wife, wake up the baby, slam the door, cry over the crib, you know, lose, lose the job. She burns down the apartment. All that's been so unbelievably painful but of course, you're checking your watch. And you're I, like, it's same thing. 20, you're like, 25 minutes. So yeah, you're you like, know, there's the, another the, hour of this. Right. Movie. It says two, two and a half hours. So so I thought, you know, of course, that this was going to be classic American journey to recovery. And then I found out that that's a very recent genre and not the genre we were in at all. And so I found myself almost laughing against my will. Like, I, I feel like this movie is almost entirely carried on the beauty of Jack Lemmon's performance. And that's not to take anything away from Lee Remick or anybody else in this movie, but the utter emotional range that he has to go through from charming. He plays a Jack Lemmon character and then he plays Gollum and they're somehow the same character. And when he plays Gollum, it's unbearable to watch. And when he plays Jack Lemmon, you laugh. And when he kisses his kid goodnight, it's totally tender. And I never really bought Jack Lemmon as a romantic leading man. But when his wife leaves and he tells her that she's that she's got to go if she's not going to commit to sobriety, that's that's as tender as any romantic scene in any romantic movie. And so I almost couldn't believe in the middle of that harrowing experience that I was laughing at Jack Lemon. But somehow that movie just works. Yeah, I'll talk about the laughs. That's I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's part of my moment is about the laughter. You mentioned this as a teleplay and where the commercials would be. It's funny because one of my reactions when it was over was it was very much like watching The Honeymooners, 
Now, somebody out there listening might think, what are you talking about? Like, they don't go together at all. But it is like watching The Honeymooners in the sense that this movie is 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 all about the performances. It's two people basically in one room, then you go to another room, and you watch them act. I mean, Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick are on, they're on camera. You're 99% of the movie, especially him, right? Because he's hes the guy who fought through the movie, but it's all about showcasing their talent. And that's why, of course, the honeymooners have such staying power, right? You just need a table and chairs and a door and really, really great performers. And that's what the experience of this movie is about. It's harrowing and it hurts your stomach and you forget you're watching a movie, but there's other times where you're like, I can't believe how good these people are. And, and that's it, that's part of the, the I think, the um, the way the movie knocks the wind out of your sails. Um, this may be a hot take, but there's, there's a scene where he comes over for dinner and he brings all the booze, you know, and he, he, he's got, yep. he's got literally two shopping bags of booze. They haven't taken a drink yet, or at least you haven't seen them take a drink yet. And so the viewer is confused at what's going on because he stands in one place with the roach spray. Sprays um, it over and over and over. It doesn't move. Yeah. The landlady is, is shot in this weird. She's kind of a weird talking head. Uh, the weird talking heads fill up behind her. It's almost like a fantasy sequence and you're not sure what's going on. And when he closes the door, they're both falling over laughing really really inexplicably and for no reason until it's uncomfortable for the viewer. And then my brain said, oh, I think they're drunk. And so I there's 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 interesting things going on with time in yeah. this movie where all the jumps are exactly right or extremely jarring. And one of the jumps that I think is jarring is that I think what they did is they cut out some of the booze drinking and accelerated time so that you could see it without having the experience of seeing it. Right. Because we've all seen alcohol in movies a thousand times right if you watch a Cary Grant movie he could literally drink two bottles and he's still Cary Grant <laughs> and it seems to have no effect on him and it strikes me that this is almost the artistic inverse of that where I'm not going to show you him with the glass in his hand in this scene but I'm going to show you the yeah. effects of it until you can't bear it anymore yeah because it's not about the fun first hour when you're drinking it's about like the 12th hour when you're still drinking right um Talk about him for a second. I mean, Joe Clay, right? I love how his name is Joe Clay. He's a man molded by booze. And I started to think before I knew we were going to talk today, I started to think about why he's a PR man. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that was great, right? Because, you know, the, he says his job is to pre present the good works of his clients to the public. He's all about putting on a good show, right? Like they're seen and he wants them to be seen in the best light. And the movie is about him doing that to himself. The movie is about him having to become his own PR guy. That's why when he goes to AA, you know, he has to say his name. That's a big thing. You have to say your name. And when her father says to him, well, what do you do if the client does something bad? Do you remember what he says? If you know, he says, he says um, well, you, we try not to talk about it. <laughs> and that's what the movie's about is he has to become his own PR guy. And he actually, you know, for a while he believes his own press. Like, I'm not an alcoholic, you know, and she does believe her own press. She goes, no, I could just take a couple of drinks. I just won't do it as much. And it's only until he really believes it. He goes, no, it's, it's a sickness and I can't do it. That's what he says to her at the end. I can't do it. Helped, of course, by Jack Klugman. Um, he comes to that understanding. And I just think it's, it's so, it's so good about how he comes to that, that epiphany. This girl had a good mama. Remember what, the yeah. first time you met? Yeah. Uh, that is one of the best balancing performances. Yes, I, I think I've seen in a long time. Like when the first the first time you meet him, the the father in law, you think that he's only there to be a kind of dour, right? Uh, old, old fat, right? So he's obviously already a counterweight, but they make the best use of that counterweight and. I mean, it's hard to think of um, besides his sponsor. It's, it's hard to think of a, a fourth person who's in this movie because people people just flash in and out. And I think that that's what makes the film so claustrophobic, other yeah. than that they continually end up in motel rooms right. or very, very cramped circumstances. And that's what I meant about the honeymooners is that is that the honey, the honeymooners is claustrophobic, but it's you don't notice it because it's because you're so you're 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 so delighted by by Jackie Gleason. Right. But here there's so many close ups of them sweating and them together and they're on screen so much. But I love what you just said, because it's true. You couldn't you can you can get in her father then you get in Jack Klugman. And, and that's about it. That's as, that's as, that's as many human beings as this movie can hold welcome back so of course in part two we like to talk about the key scenes or the big moments that tell you something about the film as a whole dan what do you got 
So my moment is when Jack Lemmon is behind Lee Remick in the elevator early in the film and he pulls his cheeks apart and sticks his tongue out and makes that face. And I think that's a great moment because like everything else in this movie, it begins in a spirit of fun. Like everything in this movie starts so innocently, right? And that old cliche is, you know, the trouble with trouble is that it begins as, it starts out as fun. And when you start doing this, you almost think you're in the apartment part two or something, right? You get Jack Lemmon as the lead. You find who who directed this movie? Blake Edwards. Blake Edwards directed. So you it, think right? you think you're in Breakfast at Tiffany's, right? You think I'm going to be in this like the title Days of Wine and Roses? Like I like wine. Everyone <laughs> likes roses. Like that's kind of cool. Like I could do that, right? And and Henry Mancini did the music, right? Because it's part of the Henry Mancini collection on Criterion, and he does the delay, and then. The movie starts to turn and it very subtly, until it really hits you in the stomach in the middle, starts to channel surf almost into this other universe. And it gets to the point where the characters start to think they're funny, but we don't. Because the scene when he sneaks up to her room at her father's house and he has the two bottles taped to his legs and they're laughing so much and she's putting down the pills for him to walk on and they're giggling like you kind of watch it like it's a train wreck because it is like that scene is not funny. They're laughing. They're having a great time, but we're not having a great time because we're so uncomfortable because we've just been lied to. Remember, as he's going up, her father says, Joe, do you want a beer? And he's like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. And you're proud of him. You're proud of Joe Clay for saying that. And then he gets into the room and you realize he's lied to you too. Like You've been betrayed as well. And so the whole way that the movie works to suck you in, I think is brilliantly done. You know, I, I think it harkens back to there's because th that's the night that they're going to he's going to drink in front of her. And then a week later, he's going to give her her first drink. She's never had a drink, which is, of course, what her father says later in right. the greenhouse. He said, you gave right. my father, uh, you, you gave my daughter her first drink. And yep. so if you watch that scene again. He makes kind of like a strange gargoyle face like over her right shoulder, which I I don't find charming at all now. Uh, right. It's it's frightening because right. it's the devil's behind her. Right. And she doesn't right. like she doesn't know it and he doesn't mean to be it. But that's what it is. Right. Because before you know what this movie is going to become, you think it's going to be a silly kind of, oh, there's Jack Lemmon being funny in an elevator. And then when you watch it again, right, when you realize exactly who he's going to be to her, it's it's you can't watch it the same way. So what's your yeah, moment? And, and there's Go no ahead. there's no she's not going to get saved at the end. Right. You know, or, or at <laughs> right. least we we hope she will. Right. The, la right. the last line is the daughter says, you know, um, uh, you know, is she going to get better? And he says, well, I did. My moment is when Jack Lemon drags himself into the office through the elevator and the, the his secretary is telling him that there's been like 10 phone calls for him and please answer. And he says, all right, all right, all right. Coffee. Coffee. He argues with her. He sits down. He tries to get out his razor to shave. And before he can prepare himself, his boss comes in to tell him that he's been uh, put on the Houston account, that he's he's been he's been taken off because he's one of those guys that just drinks too much. And I can't count. It, it's, a, it's a trope of movies, right? That the, that the boss who's in control is either, uh, you know, it, it drags himself in. He's got the office staff uh, around him, right? But essentially everything's held in control more or less. And what you find out is that in the universe of Days and Wine and Roses, that that's not true. That the there's there's utter problems in the office. There actually is real chaos. It's it's not fake chaos the way that you would get in His Girl Friday or something, right? Where everybody's flustered, but everything's fine. Here, everybody's flustered, but nothing is fine. Right. And and the things that people do in the scenes before have actual ramifications for the scene after. And I think that that's maybe one of the differences between drama and comedy. This is this is some form of comedy, but where it's the 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 domino in front of you is about to smash you in the face and there's nothing you can do about it instead of you pushing it ahead and it's uh, that's great that you brought up that moment because remember there's it that scene is the parallel to the earlier one where jack lemon tells his boss he doesn't want to be on that account anymore with the prince because he doesn't want to get a bunch of girls for these parties because he kind of thinks he's above it and he's like i'm not complaining i'm not complaining and he, i have an idea and he calls up the other guy and jack lemon's so nervous because you're like he's going to blow this job right but he wants remember he says he wants to have class so the first time he talks to his boss he's like i want to have class i want to do something better and then of course because of his drinking the whole thing flips and now you have no class. We're sending you out to Houston. Did you notice the other strange inversion in the movie between two scenes? Which one? When he puts his kid to bed. No. And he, he goes when she comes to visit and he tucks her in and closes the door and she starts to talk and he says it's, it's late and she's asleep. 
Oh, that's and great. so and so it's the absolute inversion of the scene when he comes home drunk. And so I think I, there's a lot of inversions like that, right? Because alcohol turns the world upside, upside down, down and it certainly turns the film upside down. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's your experience of watching it. If you go into this, that, that was my point. If you go into this thinking it's the apartment part two, you, you know, as Jack says in The Shining, you got a big surprise coming. So welcome back. In the last part, we talk about the last scene of the title. Mike, what's your take on either one? Well, I was just talking about the inversion of the of the ending scene. It's again, I never bought Jack Lemon as a romantic lead. That's one of the most romantic scenes, though. It's I, I love you, but I can't be with you. It's heartbreaking. It's tender. He, he sends her away. It's an inversion of that first scene because now she's the loud drunk and he's the responsible parent. And so everybody's fully transformed. Everything in, in the literary sense is fulfilled, uh, but it's a deeply painful ending. And I think that the reason that they get away with it is, is by showing the harm to others, right? Because when Jack Lemmon says, I love you, but I can't be with you. He's not just talking about himself. He's talking about their kid. And that's the, that's the extra element um, of who's in it. Right. If, if it's like the scene in Romeo and Juliet, when all their parents come in and they, they find, they find the two of them, right. It, it's, it starts to get contextualized from the societal perspective, from the audience's perspective. And it, it's the same thing with a kid, right? It's, it's different when they're on this path of self-destruction or even when they're hurting their parents' feelings, but it's totally different because the kid in herself is totally innocent. And I don't, I don't know if you remember the weird scene where she's yelling and screaming and trying to fight her mom when he's, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. she's all over the grandfather, which again is like, that's that's almost an even bigger train wreck than uh, Jack Lemmon pulling apart the greenhouse, right. which I think it's a, that's supposed to be the sucker punch of the movie. But the real ending, of course, is him looking out on the on the street as she walks away, as she right. kind of clumsily crosses the, bar, the street bar sign. and and the bar sign. So of course we all get the high irony, you know, of the bar sign, you know, flash flashing the the light on him. But I think you're also intended to realize that he's not necessarily yet out of prison. That right it's it's not like okay you get a little bit sober and you get off free right it's it's not him and the little girl in the park together it's them in very straight circumstances quiet circumstances it's literally lights out and you see him through the window and so i think that there's something about it that's meant to be a commentary on on freedom and or a certain kind of isolation right because of course she's free but she's not free she's not free and he's enclosed but he's freer in a way. He says, can't right. you see that I've been sober for a year and I'm and I love it that I'm working and I'm steady. We have this. And that's essentially what she's saying to him is that to, to be with you in this life would be to lock myself up and I and I can't do it. Yeah, she rejects his coffee. She, she doesn't want his life of coffee. Right. And I love that he's found a certain freedom. And the movie is filled with images of prison bars. So the, after the after the greenhouse, when when um, Jack Lemmon's in the drunk tank with the, with the straight jacket on, there's all these further scenes where like there's like, a, you know, a, the window pane is, is looks like gates and it's over someone's face because, you know, they, we did we already did the film Prisoners, but that's also a good title for this movie because they are prisoners. And, and he he's achieved a kind of freedom that she doesn't have yet because he's free from the thing that was you know um chaining him down but of course so ironically right you're only free while you're on the inside right right and if you're on the outside you're not free right she walks and, away a prisoner right and that's where i think the actual sense of of irony uh yeah. comes from because of course we've all watched a, a million movies or or you know kind of cheap novels where like only freedom is freedom and i think that this is a weird Right. Commentary on that to say, like, no, actually staying within certain parameters is is freedom and it doesn't always look charming. Right. He He's not like he's not like leaning there, enjoying his coffee by the window. He's totally agonized for the circumstances uh, that that he's put all of them in. But at the same time, he has made some sort of achievement. And so it's yeah. it doesn't leave you fully resolved, but it leaves you just resolved enough to end. Yeah, you don't feel that's a great that's a great point because it's not like the stand up and cheer sobriety movie of the season. Like when it's over, you're right. He's not like doing arts and crafts with his daughter and helping her with her math homework. Like you get the sense totally from the Jack Klugman character that 
that Joe Clay has decades and decades to go, which is why, you know, for the rest of your life, you're called a recovering alcoholic because as the film shows us, all it takes is one drink back and one slip back to go down that road. So he's achieved this freedom, um, but that freedom is very, very tenuous. You know what he is? A lifer. He, he is a lifer. He is a lifer. Absolutely. So my take on the ending was, I just want to end by reading something really quick from one of our favorite books, which is The Life of Samuel Johnson by James Boswell. And there's a great bit that I kept thinking of in that book when I was watching this film, and I just want to read it. And it's about Johnson's character, and it's about his appetites. And, and here's what Boswell says about Johnson, quote, everything about his character and manners was forcible and violent. There never was any moderation. Many a day did he fast, many a year did he refrain from wine, but when he did eat, it was voraciously. When he did drink wine, it was copiously. He could practice abstinence, but not temperance. And I think that that's what the movie is about, right? Is that Jack has to learn how to practice abstinence. She thinks she can practice temperance, but she can't. She goes, so what? I like alcohol a lot. So what? It's never... and, that, and that's, I couldn't stop thinking of that line watching this movie. He could practice abstinence, but not temperance. I think it's also really moving. And one of the things that the that his father-in-law does is prove that it's possible, though. Yes. Right. Because that stops it from being a very special episode of a days of wine and roses. Yes. Right. Which which is that alcohol is evil for everybody. Yes. Right. Because the the what you see is a, like a hardworking guy uh, after literally just moving trees for his entire life. Right. With that old weathered face. Right. He sits there and says there's nothing wrong with a beer or three. And he laughs. Right. Because he's going to indulge himself a little bit. And that's what the two of them think that they can do. Right. But unfortunately, they're in they're in life's jail and they either have to deal with it or not deal with it. But there are major consequences for not dealing with it. And I think that the thing that I love the most about this movie is, is maybe, the, again, the difference between a certain kind of comedy and a certain kind of drama is how real the consequences are. Yeah. Right. If like the honeymooners. Right. If you turn to the consequence dial all the way up to 10 on the honeymooners, you would get a very different kind of show or movie, right? If you just if you threaten to beat your wife in the face every single day of your life, right? You'd have you'd have the episode where he goes to visit his wife at the, at the lady shelter, right. right? That's that's what it would be. It would be it wouldn't be funny. And that's what Days of Wine and Roses is like. It's like it's like if they drank like they were in a Cary Grant movie, but somebody turned the consequence dial all the way to 11. And just let the consequences of that ride out for people who love you, for people who are trying to work with you, for people who are trying to deal with you, for your children, for each other. You couldn't live together. Because what is the consequence of excessive drinking in Hollywood movies? If you drink like Harry Grant in Hollywood movies, the traditional consequence is the next morning you have an ice pack on your head and you say, oh, get me some coffee. Like, like, And then you're, you, the hangover is gone within – how long does a hangover last in a Hollywood movie? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes about till somebody brings you tomato juice, <laughs> right? To, or black coffee. That's a that's a great thing in Stagecoach. I love how Thomas Mitchell, as the drunk doctor, can deliver a baby. He's been drunk for forty years. He has a pot of. He says coffee black. It's got to be black, of course. And if you have one cup of black coffee, you're fit to be an obstetrician. And that's like something that that Hollywood has shown us because drunkenness is supposed to be funny and amusing, in in a lot of movies in a lot of ways. But here, like you said, it dials up the consequences. And like what you said about her father, you know, the film tells us that it's a lottery whether or not you're going to end up like Joe Clay or like her father, right? So when Jack Klugman is talking to Jack Lemon, he says, you're sick, you're sick. Goes, what about me? He goes, I can't explain it. He goes, you don't go to the hospital until you're sick, until you know there's something wrong, right? So why Joe Clay becomes an alcoholic is never really explained. It's just like you kind of like lost this lottery. That's why she's eating the chocolate in the beginning because there was this old, I don't know if you ever heard this old thing about how like, you know, people who are more addicted to sweets are more likely to become alcoholics. There's some old, I don't know if it's true or not, but that's like an old- You know, a psychotherapist. Yeah, exactly. Told- yeah, there's an old thing about that. That's why it's in the movie with her addiction to chocolate. She has a quote unquote addictive personality, but the movie doesn't explain why her father-in-law could have three beers and why for Jack Lemon, one's too many and a hundred and enough. It's just like the way it is. And he gets dealt this hand and that's just the way. It, but he kind of realizes what that's about. And it does it, he does it in a way that's very unlike the, the way we're used to seeing alcoholism in movies. Yeah, exactly. Like if you if you think about that consequence style again, right? We all laugh at the honeymooners, but it's a world without 
consequences, right? Right. And and if you turn that consequence dial up and you watch the honeymooners, right? It, and and Ralph Cramden followed through on what he said he was going to do, you'd end up in a different show. It would become yeah. Law and Order Special Victims Unit, Absolutely. right? And this is this is a this is a comedy where that same consequence dial gets tweaked, and instead you end up in Days of Wine and Roses where the consequences are the plot. And yeah. I think that that's why it gets away with being a classic film, but showing a different kind of moral universe than you see in other classic films. And that's why, of course, the Honeymooners, you can watch the Honeymooners episodes in any order. It doesn't matter because at the end of every episode, you you're, you hit reset and you're back to the first square on shoots and ladders. In this film, that does not happen. The order of the scenes is almost the only thing that matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. So great conversation, Mike. Thanks for thanks for listening, everybody, to our conversation. We hope you enjoyed listening to us talk about Days and Wine of Roses. It's on Criterion now. If you haven't seen it in a while, it's terrific. It totally deserves a second watch. Follow us on Twitter at 15MINFilm. You can also follow us on Letterboxd and see what we've been watching. Keep the requests coming. See you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>